I'm about to study the incorruptible, inerrant Word of God. I open my heart to God's message. I humble my mind to His wisdom, and I rest my hopes on His grace. I will accept its rebukes with repentance, rejoice in its truth by faith, and trust in its promises that can never fail. I can be what it says I can be. I can do what it says I can do. I can change what it says I can change as I trust in His grace and spirit. I covenant with God that I'm ready to learn, I'm ready to grow, and I'm ready to change as I hide His Word in my heart and honor Jesus Christ as the Lord of my life. Do you hear the optimism in those statements, I can be what it says I can be, I can do what it says I can do, I can change what it says I can change? Do you believe that this morning? Amen, because He's there to empower it, isn't He? Praise the Lord. All right, children, and discipleship class, you can dismiss yourselves. Many of us have heard about the revival this week at Asbury, and it's also spread to a few other college campuses. But interestingly enough, I had already decided on the subject matter of this week's uh, part six of our series, and uh, it wasn't until later this week that I heard a little clip, or just the introduction rather, of the message that was preached at Asbury when revival broke out. And it was interesting that he was preaching on Romans 12 about divine love. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. And then all the 30-some characteristics that Paul lists after that about divine love. Now, we're not going to be in Romans 12 this morning, but we are going to be talking about the ripple effect of love. But we're going to be using the word constantly, divine love, because it's the better translation of what is almost always in the Scriptures when we talk about agape. You've all heard messages many, many times about the four loves. C.S. Lewis, of course, was famous for writing the book, The Four Loves. If you haven't read it, read it. You need to. It will be a life changer. It's an incredible book. But nonetheless, they, the Greek language has four different words for love, and we, we kind of screw it up in English a little bit. You know, the context is the only thing that tells us what we mean. Because, you know, you hear somebody say, I love pizza, and I love my dog, and I love my kids, and I love my wife, or I love my husband. We don't mean the same thing by any of those. Uh, the context tells us. But in the Greek language, you had different words. You had eros for romantic love. You had uh, philios for friendship and affectionate love. And you had storge for family love. And, uh, but then there was this word that was very general for love, which the Christians adopted to use to refer to God's love specifically. And that's the Greek word agape, or as we sometimes anglicize it, agape. But agape is that love which we do not possess, but which God gives to us as believers which, as we're going to learn, is to be the identifier of who we are. We are different from everyone else because of His divine love, what He's done for us and what He does in us. And so this morning, I want us to begin looking at these ripples of divine love. Now, Jesus made it clear we were to impact the world. He did not leave us here. You know, wouldn't it be interesting that if when you got saved… That, you know, you said yes to Jesus, yes, Lord, I'll be your follower, and instantly, boom, you were raptured. How many people you think would want to be saved? Well, it, we'd probably get a big crowd in here, you know, you, oh, yeah, yeah, instant rapture, man, yes, glorification, yeah. But why did God leave you here? Why doesn't He just immediately zap you and, and make you immortal and take you to heaven? Because He has a job for you to do. As the body of Christ, we are Jesus' flesh and blood on this planet. We are called to be His body through which He expresses Himself. That's why He puts His Holy Spirit in every believer, but He's not just in every believer. He is in the church, and He combines us into a body so that each person is like a 
member of the body, like a hand or like a, a foot or like a mouth or like an ear or like an eye. Each of us have different functions, but we're all part of the same body. And we all need each other. And so, this is why He left us here. And so, Jesus has made it clear that we are supposed to impact the world. And we're to impact the world by setting in motion ripples of grace and transformation by means of divine love possessing us. And yes, I use the word possession. We are to… Do you realize as a Christian you're supposed to be possessed? <laughs> yes, I'm, and I mean that in the most positive sense. You are to be possessed by a spirit, and it's the Spirit of God Almighty, the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. You, and unfortunately, there are many people possessed by different spirits in this culture, and many people are just deeply influenced by evil spirits, but we are to be filled and controlled and directed by the Spirit of God. We are to be possessed. Now, He doesn't come in to possess us by putting us into bondage. Rather, He comes in to free us. He comes in to give us power to be our best self. And He only comes in if you invite Him in and you say yes to Him and then give Him permission to give direction to your life. So, yes, you are to be possessed by the Holy Spirit of God. And to, unfortunately, too many Christians have lost sight of that. That the Christian life is just about religion and a few rules and regulations and keeping the Ten Commandments and doing some good stuff and blah, 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 blah. That's dead religion. It won't save you. You are to be made new. You're to be born again from above, born anew of them. You are to be brought to life in your spirit, and you are to be then have the Holy Spirit welded to your spirit so that you have eternal life even now. You see, right now, if I drop dead, I hope it wouldn't traumatize any of you. If I did, because I'd be okay. I'd just be saying, hello, Jesus. But if I were to drop dead right now, I've got eternal life already. So I would not die in the sense of being separated from God, and I would know that I'm going to be resurrected because He said, because I live, you too are going to live, and that we are all going to be called out of the grave to live eternally with Him if we have put our faith in Christ. Boy, what a wonderful, wonderful truth. And yet too many believers have tried to dumb this down to something else to something just mere religion, mere rules. But no, we're to be possessed by the Holy Spirit. And when we are possessed by the Holy Spirit, something else happens. God's nature, God's divine love comes to live inside of us. Look at Romans 5.5. 5. And hope does not disappoint us because, why? God has poured out His divine love, His agape, into our hearts. How did He do that? By the Holy Spirit whom He has given to us. So the first thing you need to notice in regard to that verse of Scripture is that divine love comes from God and is poured into our hearts or fills up our hearts. It is not a natural but a supernatural characteristic. Christian, do you all know that you're supernatural? That's right. You're supernatural. If you have the Holy Spirit living in you, that's not just of this natural world. You have the ultimate supernatural living inside of you. The Creator God who spoke everything into existence and maintains it in existence. Oh, come on. Quit looking at me like that. Oh, yeah, that sounds like It's the truth. You are supernatural because of God living in you. It's not you yourself, it is Him who has honored you by putting His life into you. And notice that this divine love comes from God. He has poured it out. We don't have it naturally, but He's poured it out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit He's given to us. Remember Galatians 2.22 teaches us that the fruit of the Spirit is what? 
love. Now, most people just keep right on reading, and that's okay because Paul lifts several eight other characteristics. But here's what we need to understand. Notice that the word fruit is singular. It didn't say the fruits of the Spirit. It says the fruit of the Spirit is love. And most of us believe, as we look at that in the Greek, that Paul intends for us to understand that love is the comprehensive fruit, and everything else is just a description of how love behaves itself and the qualities that it has. So when Paul adds joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, he's saying that's what love is like. That's what God's divine love is like. And so the fruit, the single fruit of the Spirit is divine love, because when He comes in, He brings God's nature, and God's nature is full of joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, and all those beautiful traits of the Spirit. And this we'll see very clearly when we just touch on for a few moments this morning 1 Corinthians 13, which is the great hymn of love. The second thing you see from this verse of Scripture is the Holy Spirit who pours this divine love into us does so by Himself being in us. In other words, Paul declares that the Spirit is given to us. Remember on the day of Pentecost, the disciples were all what? Filled with the Holy Spirit. The best way to really translate what's happening there, what the Scripture means there, is to kind of translate it into an English vernacular, which would be something like this, which really catches the sense of what the original Greek is saying. They were all saturated with the Holy Spirit. Remember the illustration I've used several times. What is, how do you know when, let's, for example, a sponge is saturated? How do you know? Well, you take a dry sponge, you start pouring water into it. Nothing's coming out. You just keep pouring, nothing's coming out, nothing's coming out. And then all of a sudden, it starts coming out the other side. And what do we say? Oh, it's saturated. It can't hold anymore. In other words, the water has filled up every cell, so to speak, of that sponge. That's what happened to the disciples on the day of Pentecost. Remember, on the night of the resurrection, John chapter 20 verses 19 to 23, that Jesus gave the disciples the Holy Spirit and breathed on them, and that's when they got the Holy Spirit. But He told them to wait for a work of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, the promise of the Father that would give them power to be witnesses, and Peter says it purified the heart by faith, is what he teaches in Acts 15, and the point of it is, is that we are saturated by the Holy Spirit. Now, that means They didn't get more of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit got more of them. You see the difference? You see, you can't have the Holy Spirit in pieces. It's not like you get, you know, a leg of the Holy Spirit. And I'm I'm just being silly, but, you know, the Holy Spirit doesn't come like You don't get the Holy Spirit in pieces. You either have Him or you don't. But He can get more of you as you let Him tear down the barriers to His control in your life. And let him control everything. And the more you are controlled, the more saturated you are by his presence and his nature and his manifestation of who he is through you. That's what a Christian is supposed to be. So we are to be saturated as they were by the Holy Spirit. The redemptive ripples of Christ's kingdom comes from the unconquerable power of divine love. Now, the world does not and cannot understand this. You see, Jesus came into the world and said, I'm going to conquer with power under. I'm going to conquer with divine love. I'm going to love people and change the world. And the world looks at it and goes, you got to be kidding. You know how you change the world? You change the world with conquest and with power and with tyranny. And Jesus says, no, I'm going to change the world by laying my life down as a ransom for many. I'm going to love people so much that it will be an earthquake of transformation in the world. And we are the people who have bought into what Jesus demonstrated by the cross of Jesus Christ. You see, the world does not and cannot understand the love of God. All they know is the fragile human loves of Eros, Phileos, and Storge. And they are good and they're wonderful in their place, but we've all seen them fail. But God's love doesn't fail, and the world thinks that the only way that you can make change is with power and with conquest. But this is because they don't understand. They're ignorant of the transforming, unconquerable nature of divine love. You know, the ultimate example 
of divine love's power is the cross of Christ. You know, the divine love poured out there could not be conquered by the shredding of Jesus' flesh, by the claws of the Roman, uh, for, uh, trying to think of the name of fla- f- flagrum. Yeah, it was the flagrum, the whip, the nine catatail. Uh, <laughs> Nine tails, cat, no, whatever, cat tails, you know. Can you see I didn't sleep very good last night, okay? <laughs> the flagrum, nonetheless, is known as a cat of nine tails. There we go. Got my tang tangled, you see. It was a terrible weapon, terrible weapon of torture. Many people died from that alone. But nor could the nails which they drove through the base of his palms into the nerves, the medial nerve there, which created excruciating pain, nor could that conquer him. Or the nails they drove through his feet, could they conquer his love. Nor the mocking and unjust ridicule of the religious leader. It couldn't conquer his divine love. Neither could death, three days in the grave, conquer him in his divine love. He conquered death, hell, and the grave and walked out of it so you and I might be forgiven and have eternal life forever and forever. So we must understand that his divine love conquered everything. What held Jesus to the cross? It wasn't the nails. It was divine love. Remember, Paul tells us that Jesus Christ... Colossians, the first chapter, starting about verse 15. Down in that passage, he tells us that he holds all things together by the power of his word. The Greek is the energia of his word, the power of his word. He's not only created everything, he's sustaining it and causing it to remain in existence. Do you realize the nails that were driven through Jesus' hands, which we say held him to the cross, he was holding the nails together? He was holding the cross together. So the only thing that was holding Jesus to the cross was his intention to be there because he loved us. Because otherwise he could have just spoken it all out of existence. He didn't have to hold it together. He was holding together the very nails that were pinning him to that cross. No wonder the Apostle Paul would point to the fact that the power of divine love manifested through Christ is unconquerable unconquerable. Most of us know and love this passage of Scripture from the end of Romans chapter 8. For I am convinced. Is there anything you're convinced of? I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor the present, nor the future, nor any powers, nor anything else, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to do what? To separate us from the love, and that should be divine love, agape of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wow. So, what we're going to see, there is nothing that can conquer God's divine love. So, divine love is the central weapon that propagates God's truth in the world. Now, we know that truth itself is a weapon. However, it is only really truth if it is is inseparably joined to divine love. You see, Paul talks about speaking the truth in love. Those are the two imperatives. You've got to have both or you don't have either. If you try to just be nothing but about truth and beat people up with truth all the time, guess what? You're you're denying the greatest truth, which is God's love. Therefore, you're not really being truthful because you're not sharing the greatest truth. At the same time, you say, oh, we're just going to be loving and tolerant and let everything go. Well, you're not being loving because you're not giving people the truth that can set them free and change their lives and get them out of the bondage they're in. So you have to have both truth and love. And so both are weapons, but they must be joined together. And we are called to propagate the truth, the gospel, to the world, but we cannot do that without divine love. We can't do it at all. As we look at God's plan for redemptive ripples of love through the lives of his people for the purpose of redeeming the world, we come to the realization of the absolute imperative for you and me as believers to be filled with supernatural love because we don't have the right kind of love left to ourselves that can really conquer and change the world and redeem it. 
but we do through the power of the Spirit. So this leads us to our primary point this morning, and that is this. Divine love is indispensable. Divine love is indispensable. You're not a Christian without it. It's indispensable, and you can't do the work of the kingdom which you are called to do. And if you're not doing it, you're not fulfilling your calling because God has called you to do with the work of the kingdom. But divine love is absolutely indispensable because you can't do it without it. Now, to drive this home, we're just going to look at two passages very quickly this morning. One I've covered before, so I'll cover it quickly. But I want us to look at Jesus' new great command his new great command. Now, I have done the word studies with you before on this, so I will just mention it briefly and move on to validate that what I'm about to read to you is the correct way to understand what Jesus is saying. Jesus says, a new command I give you. Now, many people read it and go, wait, wait a minute, this isn't new, this isn't new. I mean, he says, to, to, to love one another. That was in the Old Testament. You know, love God, love your neighbor as yourself. You know, well, what's so new about that? Well, a couple of things. First of all, Jesus uses the word agape, which means I want divine love to be in your lives and show up in your life. And then secondly, when he uses the word new, he means I'm giving it a new status. He's not saying you've never heard this before. He's saying I'm making this a new commandment of status. In other words, this is your new great commandment. So the, the great commandment in the Old Testament, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and there's a second like unto it, love your neighbors yourself. Jesus blends them together and elevates them a little bit and says, now there's a new great commandment for the believer, and this is our one command. We fulfill it. We fulfill all other commands. That's the beauty of this. So here's what Jesus said on that occasion. He said, I give you a new command with an elevated status. In other words, a new great command. Have divine love. Notice he uses the word agape for one another. As I have divinely loved you, so you must divinely love one another. He didn't say you should. He said you must divinely love one another. By this, all people will know that you're my disciples if, there's that big word again, if you are divinely loving one another. Otherwise, they won't know that you're my disciples, because you won't look like my disciples. So, we see that Jesus is giving us something very important here. So, I want you to notice a couple things about what he's saying here. First of all, notice the supremacy of this command. Do this at all cost, even the cost of your own life, for that's the example Jesus is going to lay down. I've told you before that Jesus uses the Greek word for command, entole, in this passage. It was a common word often used for the word command or commandment. But it does have a history which we need to be aware of because it would have triggered something in the disciples' mind. Jesus is about to leave them and go to the cross, and he's telling them all night, I'm leaving. And they're saying, why can't we go with you? He says, well, you can't come now, you'll come later. But the point is, is that Jesus then is acting like a general to his troops, telling them what the prime directive is for them to accomplish. In a military campaign before a great battle, a general would stand up and give a speech to his soldiers. And he would always, at some point in that speech, say, this is the prime directive. This is what you're here to accomplish. This is what you die for. And then he would say the entole. This is the entole. This is what you die for. This is what you do, you accomplish at all costs. Then he would tell them what it is. We're going to take back our city. We're going to do whatever. We're going to save our people. Whatever it was, this is what you're here to do. Jesus uses that term, a new entole. I give you a new prime directive. Do this. This is what you lay your life down for. Love divine love. So you see the supremacy of this command. He's saying, I'm elevating this. This is the one thing you do at all cost. Notice the vertical supernatural nature of this command. You see, you must be reconnected to God in justification and sanctification through the Spirit who gives you this divine love. You cannot do this on your own. Jesus did not say, just love people. He said, I want to see God's divine love 
going through your life toward people and toward one another. I cannot love you with divine love unless I'm connected with God who gives me that divine love by His Holy Spirit. Human love is not enough. Human loves fail. God's divine love doesn't fail. We often fail because we disconnect from the guidance of the Spirit in divine love, but we shouldn't. Our goal should be to be completely submissive and surrendered to the direction of the Spirit and His love in our lives. Notice the vertical supernatural nature of this command. You must get connected this way before you can do it this way. So it sounds very horizontal when he says, this is my new great command, divinely love one another. But no, the, hor- the vertical part is in the divine love, not just human love. Notice the horizontal application of the command, what Jesus is saying, I want to see this show up in the way your relationships look. Uh-oh. I could give the altar call right now, couldn't we? For all of us. Do our relationships really look like relationships that are governed by sacrificial divine love? This is the horizontal application. Jesus wants the proof of His divine love in our lives to be seen in relational verification, which leads to a question for me and for you. Do your relationships with your spouse, your children, your parents manifest this divine love on your part? Now, notice I added on your part because, of course, you cannot force others to reciprocate. You can love them, and they may not love you back. Yet that does not let us off the hook. God has given us His love to love with. We are obligated, as His redeemed followers, to love others, even when they do not love us back. Jesus loved us unto death, even when we were mocking Him and spitting on Him and driving nails into Him. He still prayed for the forgiveness of those who were doing that to Him. Of course, we can't force others to reciprocate. And yes, sometimes that's complicated. And loving someone does not always mean pleasing them. They may want you, and they may want from you what is sinful or destructive to themselves. You will have to love them enough to be the bad guy, so to speak, in their estimation, and lovingly and kindly say, no, I can't do that, or I can't say yes because you love them too much. Now, notice next the exemplifier of this command. Jesus said, as I have divinely loved you, so you are to divinely love one another. So who is setting the standard? Who is the exemplifier? Jesus is. He's the exemplifier of this command. And so, His cross is the full expression of that divine love. How was He going to love them? By going to the cross to die for them. And yes, we are to have the same kind of divine love ruling our lives so that we can do the things Jesus did and love the way Jesus did. I think the Apostle John, likely thinking back to this very night and this command, this new great command, and remembering the cross that followed it, gave us 1 John 3.16. Now, if I ask almost any of you quote for me John 3, 16, you could all quote it. And and of course, I'm I'm glad you can. It's one of the most precious verses of Scripture in all the Bible. God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes into Him should not perish, but what? Have eternal life. Aren't you glad that's true? (laughs) Praise God. It is true. Amen. But we all like to quote that verse but not so much 1 John 3.16. How many of you can quote 1 John 3.16? Ah, and it's just as important. And I think John was thinking back to that night and about what Jesus then did when he said, in the same way I love, that's how I want you to love. And here's what John wrote. This is how we know what divine love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Ooh. Ouch. 
Maybe we don't shout and praise God so much on that one. <laughs> you mean for that old blowhard that's, you know, I, I got to lay my life down for them? <laughs> Jesus said, that's how we're to live. Even for those who were cursing him, he prayed for them. For those who were driving nails in him, he prayed for them. This is how we know what divine love is. He put it on display. Now we need to put it on display in our lives as well. I heard an interesting story. I read an interesting story this week. It reminded me. And it was about the soldiers. In this case, it was about the the Scottish regiment that were taken captive by the Japanese and were made to work on this bridge, the railroad bridge they were building over the River Kwai. And you, many, many of you have maybe seen the movie and you realize how horrifying, it was a true story, how horrifyingly they were treated. They were treated with such cruelty and nearly starved to death and made to work uh, as slaves for long, long hours. And in one of the daily checks, a guard had assembled this Scottish regiment and they did, always did a count of the shovels because shovels could be used as a weapon, of course. And so they did a count of the shovel and they said, one shovel is missing. Well, nobody knew where any shovel was, but the guard said, there is a shovel missing and someone better step forward with it right now or you're all going to get it, get punished. No one stepped forward. The guard got enraged. Finally, he said, I'm going to kill every last one of you if someone doesn't step forward. And he took his gun and he cocked it, and he was at the first one in the line, he was going to start putting bullets in each head, and they knew he meant every word of it. And they had often watched that happen. Finally, down at the other end, a man stepped forward. He didn't say a word, he just stepped forward. The guard put his gun away, picked up a shovel, went down and beat the man to death with the shovel. Then he released the men to go to the next checkpoint. They picked up their comrade, his bloody body, and they carried him to the next checkpoint where they counted the shovels again and discovered there was no shovel missing. The guard had miscounted. But this man, knowing they were all doomed anyway, said, I'll be willing to give my life so the others can live. The man who was reporting that story talks about how the prisoners reported that before that event, they had been fighting and fussing among themselves. They were divided and there was rancor and anger going on. But after that event, because of that example of sacrificial love, that they were pulled together as a unit and it changed their lives. And they began to think about God and think about what He had done for them. And when the allies came in and took over the camp, and now they were in charge. They walked in front of their guards, and instead of taking revenge on them, they said to them, no more torture, no more persecution, no more cursing, forgiveness. Wow. Love can change a lot. So, Notice the identifier resulting from this command. Jesus said, they will know that you're my disciples. How? If you have divine love for one another. I think about how Jesus talked about the fact that in his first sermon he ever gave us, the Sermon on the Mount, we call it. In Matthew 4, he calls his first disciples. In Matthew 5, he sets them down and says, boys, this is the standard of my kingdom. Here's what it is. Divine love. And one of the passages talks about how you're to even have enough love to be able to turn the other cheek, go the, give the second garment, go the second mile. You remember that passage nobody likes to read? Yeah. And I love to preach on it because there's some incredible truths in there once you unpack them that make it clear this is not irrational and it's not silly because it really does work. But you remember this is what Jesus said, don't resist an evil person. That only makes sense if you know that God's in control turn the other cheek, give the extra garment, go the second mile, give when asked to, love your enemy so that you can be like your Father in heaven. So that is Jesus' manifesto. He says that's to how we're to live. 
So let's finish now with Christianity's central virtue and principle. And to do this, we're going to finish by looking at 1 Corinthians 13. And what I want to do is to look at the first three verses as being exemplary of this, Christ, of this virtue and principle that's central to the Christian faith. Look at what Paul, how, what Paul says to us. He says, if I could speak in the languages of both men and angels, but didn't have divine love for others, I am only a noisy gong or a meaningless clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy which enables me to understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have such faith that I can move mountains, but don't have divine love, my gain is zilch, nothing. You say, what translation is that? Yeah, that's the pastor's expanded translation. And yes, the word zilch is an appropriate word for the Greek word there. Nothing, nada, zero. Now, notice what he's saying here. It doesn't matter if you have great spiritual gifts and you can do great things like speak in all the languages of the world and even of angels. And if you have, you know, <laughs> you know that kind of ability, he says, but if you don't have divine love, everything you said would just be meaningless noise. Nothing. And if you had great spiritual knowledge and could understand all of the knowledge in the world in great faith so that you could actually move mountains, he says, but if you don't have the motive of divine love, it's worth zilch, nothing. In other words, God does not value anything done without divine love. Let's hear that, Christians. You say, well, I keep the Ten Commandments. Well, good for you. I'm glad you do. I'm glad you do. You should. But do you love people, or do you go around judging them with those commandments? Well, look how they're breaking commandment number four. Now, if you don't do what you do in divine love, zilch credit, none, because God just simply doesn't value it in any way, shape, or form. Now, let's look at the rest of this very quickly. Divine love's ripples on display. And let's just read through this passage, and I'll just make a couple of comments. He says, divine love possesses patience. And by the way, I have inserted divine love. Most places in there, we just put uh, it or something, but I've inserted it in every place here. And it is in most of the Greek. In some places, it does use, uh, you know, a substitute for it. But actually, it always means divine love. So again, divine love possesses patience. Divine love is kind. Divine love is not envious. Divine love does not boast. Divine love is not proud. Divine love is not rude. Divine love is not self-seeking. Divine love is not easily angered. Divine love keeps no record of wrongs. Divine love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Divine love always protects. Divine love always trusts. Divine love always hopes. Divine love always perseveres. Divine love never fails. And we could all get on our knees right now and start saying, Lord, forgive me. Or how often have we fallen short of that? Well, of course we have. You know who that's a description of? It's not a description of me. It's not a description of you. It's a description of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's who it's a description of. Now, yes, this divine love is to be in us and start expressing itself in this way. So we start living that way. And we can by the power of the Spirit because He pours out His divine love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit He has given to us. So we can begin living this way. And there may be little strongholds we're unaware of that keep us at times from living this way. And we may find we're responding in an irritated way or we're responding in some way that really we shouldn't be responding. But we need to let God tear that stronghold down and remove the resistance so the Holy Spirit can take over. But I remember I was trying to be patient one day, many, many years ago in college. 
My natural temperament is not patience. I want it done, done yesterday. I'm impatient with myself sometimes. I was impatient with other people. And I was trying to be patient. I remember this person was trying my patience. Ever been there? And some of you look at me right now like, Pastor, you're trying my patience. We need to get this done. <laughs> and I'm telling you, I'm only going to preach as long as it takes for us to get done. Okay, now. That's <laughs> but I remember I, I said to the Lord because I was so frustrated. I said, Lord, I'm at the end of my patience. And the Lord agreed with me. He said, I know. I know you are. Because your patience is only so long. He said, but I'm not at the end of mine. He said, whose patience is going to be in charge? Ouch. <clears throat> you get the point? I had to let Jesus take over and be patient through me. Not my righteousness, but Christ within, living and reigning and saving from sin. That's the power of the Christian. That's the power of the believer. Well, in the outline, I actually take you through, and I'm not going to do it. Those of you who have the outline, you can do it on your own and talk about each one of these. Love possesses patience. Love is kind. And I talk about what each one of these mean. And then it talks about all the negatives love has. Love does not envy. It is not jealous against other people. It can even rejoice when other people prosper. Love does not boast. Love is not proud. It's interesting. The word means puffed up. And the, the previous word where love does not boast is a very colorful word. The, the Greek word means literally to, uh, to be a braggart or a windbag, believe it or not. <coughs> Someone who is always sounding their own praises and tooting their own horn. You all know those kind of people, right? The Greek word is ou a per per uentai, and it literally means to just be a windbag. <laughs> An interesting word. Divine love is not rude. Divine love is not self-seeking. Divine love is not easily angered. It means it's not easily provoked or upset or irritable. Oops. So as you look through each of these, I should have been scrolling through these as we went. These are the characteristics of Jesus, and these characteristics should be becoming true of us. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It's not easily irritable. How easily are you irritated? You ever stop to ask yourself that question? How easily are you upset or offended or irritated? It's an important question. Someone has rightly said that the size of what it takes to offend you is the size of your character. Ooh. You ever known people going around just daring somebody to offend them? We, we talk about them having a chip on their shoulder. It's like, go ahead, knock it off. Just see what I do. If you're that kind of person, you're small, really small, because a strong person isn't easily offended, and the Holy Spirit can make us strong by His divine love. <clears throat> so what, I'll just put it up there, the size of what it takes to offend you is the size of your character. Jesus might say the quality is the, the quality of your love. Divine love keeps no record of wrongs. Well, we won't go there. <laughs> Literally means that you don't keep a catalog. You don't get out the history book when there's an argument. <laughs> Hello? Well, I know I did this, but I remember when you... And then we start in, and pretty soon it's a history lesson on both sides, right? Divine love keeps no record keeps no catalog. It doesn't write down the wrongs for later use. Divine love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. Love is not indifferent to evil. 
it hates evil and does not rejoice in it. Or they, it doesn't even rejoice when others are found and caught in it. It knows that, no, that to love it must take sides against what is, harm, what is harmful and what destroys. But it rejoices when beauty and good rules. <clears throat> now the final things. Now comes some powerful, resounding, and thrilling positives of divine love. I love this. Divine love always protects. I wish I had time to do the word study on this. But it literally means to cover over in silence and keep confidential. It means love that throws a cloak over what is displeasing in another person so that other people won't ridicule them. You cover them. You, you, you stand in the gap for them. That's what this, this word actually means. It puts up with and endures what is unpleasant. It expects the best of, of people even when appearances are against them. And Paul uses the word panta here, which means all, all the time. So, Divine love always, all the time, protects. Finally, divine love always trusts. Very important concept. Panta pistoue is the Greek. It means all faith, all trust. That's hard. In other words, we are inclined to trust. Divine love generates confidence in others, and it doesn't make us, it doesn't make us gullible, but it does make us willing to take risk to love other people, and knowing that sometimes we'll get hurt, sometimes we'll get betrayed, but it's better to love them and be mistaken than to stiff-arm them when really they were someone who needed and would have accepted that love. So, that's what this word means. It always trusts. It always all the time it has faith. Divine love always hopes, never gives up. It produces perpetual hope. It's not a sentimental optimism which blindly refuses to face reality, but it does refuse to take failure as final. Rather than accept another's failure, it holds on to the hope until all possibility for change is gone, until they know, because they know that as long as there's any hope, God can do miracles. And then the final thing, divine love always perseveres, and divine love never, never fails. Aren't you glad agape never fails? Now, none of us can live up to this picture of divine love. It's a picture of Jesus Himself, as I said. But we can begin to be more and more successful by means of His Spirit living within us. And that's what we all want. And when you come to Christ, not only does He give you His Holy Spirit, His Holy Spirit wants to do a work in you to purify your heart and to remove every bit of self-autonomy and sinful self-allegiance and all resistance to Him so that He can manifest Himself through you. That's how the apostles became powerful witnesses because their hearts were purified so there was no competing loves and Jesus' love was supreme, and that love ruled their life. Therefore, they were powerful witnesses. So, this morning, I want us to close by thinking about what does it mean to truly be people of divine love? Let's pray together. Father, there is none of us here this morning who do not need to say, forgive us for falling short. But thank you for how often we've been able to measure up in many ways because of the power of your Spirit living in us. We are not a natural people. We are a supernatural people and teach us how to lean on and trust in and depend on your Spirit and your wisdom and your power to make us greater than what we could ever be on our own because we're nothing on our own. As Jesus, you told us, without me, you can do nothing. But with you, Paul said, Christ, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So, Father, remind us that you have called us to impact the world and to create ripples of divine love that will transform people and cultures. And as we as a church begin to think about this calling you've given us for kingdom generation and how to build a school that will 
be a countercultural school that will help young people to learn reality and learn a Christian worldview. I pray that you will help us to understand how important it is to have faith and hope that we can actually accomplish this. And in the weeks ahead, as we think about that, we pray for your grace on us as a people. For we know we can do nothing on our own, but we pray for your favor, we pray for your power, we pray for your anointing, we pray for your perspective. Because when we see it as you see it, we'll lay our lives down for it in any way that you call us to. Thank you for this incredible church. Thank you for the incredible people who make it up because that is the church. And we love you. And we are so grateful that you have loved us first. Help each one of us to say a big yes to you being in charge of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.